some of the most important drivers of these changes that affect skills supply and skills demand are, of course, technolog technology and innovation, demographic changes, changes in the work organizations, uh, the globalization, for instance, of markets, or as we now see, the globalization of health issues, climate change, and many others. And uh, as Sybil has already said, skills anticipation is important to effectively and efficiently plan uh, TVET and education systems. And I wanted to spend one short word on, uh, on the connection between uh, skills needs anticipation and dual VET, because uh, a well-organized and demand-driven dual VET system is already a good way of connecting skills demand with skills supply uh, or shaping skills supply, uh, especially when the employers are actively involved and if companies are actively involved in this uh, system. Before we come to the approaches and the methodologies, I just wanted to uh, make some conceptual clarifications. So when we talk about skills, skills needs anticipation, we talk about both quantitative methodologies as well as qualitative methods. And we look at changes in occupations and we look at changes in the skills that will be needed in the future. We do so at different time horizons and at different levels. So we have the macro level that could be the national level of a country, the meso level that could be a sector or a province, or the micro level that could be a municipality, an enterprise, or a TVET school. And skills needs anticipation needs to be consistent and systematic over time. It's not a one-time exercise, but it needs to be repeated and revisited over time. And when we talk about skills matching, we talk about the measures to reduce the gaps between the skills that are demanded by the employers and the supply of skills, that is the skills that the workforce possesses or the skills of the education or TVET graduates. And uh, we will always need different measures in order to reduce skills mismatch. Uh, for instance, TVET curricula and programs that are being updated or occupational standards, career guidance, um, the work of employment services, but also VET policies to channel uh, TVET delivery. Uh, when we talk of occupations, we talk of professions, or as in German we say, Beruf. Uh, for instance, an electric fitter is, is a, an occupation. A qualification is a certified outcome for uh, training within a specific occupation. And skills we refer to the abilities within occupations, the abilities to carry out tasks or duties that make up an occupation. And this distinction is very important if we now move to the next slide, uh, where we see that skills mismatch can have different dimensions. Uh, it can have a quality, a quality dimension and a quantity dimension. So we can have mismatch along different educational fields or the skills that the persons possess, too many or too little or not the correct skills, but also along the qualification levels that may be too high or too low, or an oversupply, numeric oversupply or undersupply of people with specific qualifications. If we now move on to the next slide, um, we, um, one important thing to understand about skills anticipation is that we will not be able to project exact numbers of workers needed in a specific occupation in the future labor market, because labor markets are too dynamic uh, and economies are too dynamic. Um, what we can identify are trends and tendencies. Uh, and another important aspect is that no one methodology will give us all the information that we need. So we need to combine methodologies and we need to find for every situation the right mix. And at the left side of the slide, you can see nine main methodologies that I have listed. The ones in blue are the ones that are mainly qualitative. The ones in purple are the ones that mix qualitative and quantitative. And the red ones are the ones that uh, are more on the quantitative side. 
and uh, how you combine these different methodologies, how you find the right cocktail depends on the question that you see in the orange call out on the right. Uh, it really narrows down to what do you need to know and what do you need to find out. And this can sound as a very easy question, but um, if you think about it, do you want to know about the occupations that are in demand in the future and the occupations that are obsolete? Do you want to know about how many workers may be needed in this occupation? What are the tendencies and the trends? Um, or do you want to know about the skills changes within the occupations, about new and obsolete skills within occupational profiles? Or do you need to know both? Because that is already the first step to thinking about what methodology you would use. Then you also have to decide at what level you're working on. Are you working at a municipal level? Are you working at a sectoral level or a national? And what is your time horizon? Do you want to look into the immediate future? Uh, one to three years? Do you want to look up to five years? Or do you want to look at a larger time horizon, 10 years or 15 years? And when you have answered these questions, then you may want to look also at what data is already available. Who is producing data? Who is producing information? And then what are the gaps? And when you have answered that question, then comes the question of the financing. What is your budget? And when you have answered all of these questions, then you can say, okay, now let's look into the methodologies that we have available and that we can realistically apply. One uh, problem that we often encounter is that we don't have enough quantitative data. So if you don't have enough quantitative data or it is not sufficiently disaggregated or the quality is not good enough, you need to compensate with qualitative information uh, but of course, that also has certain limitations. Uh, and when you look at, into occupations and into uh, numbers of uh, persons that are likely to be needed on the labor market, you of course want to go more to quantitative methodologies, but you want to always cross-check with uh, qualitative methodologies. And if you look at skills within an occupational profile, you mainly want to look at qualitative information. So now we move on to the next slide. And uh, there are some remarks that I wanted to say for the next three slides. You see some things that are written in blue here. Everything that is in blue, these are links to guides uh, and uh, documents, methodological uh, guidelines that are available online, that you can click on, that you can download for free. And um, so uh, that is one thing. Another thing, I will not have time to go into each of these methodologies, but I will name a few. So tracer studies, I'm, I'm, I imagine you all are familiar with tracer studies. You have applied tracer studies, and we don't need to go into this. And many of you may have also applied employer surveys at the level of a company or several companies, a cluster of companies that gives you largely qualitative information that is important for curriculum review, for instance, or occupational standards. And you may also have worked with focus groups, which are a quick and also a very low cost option for brainstorming, developing ideas, or for validating information and for validating forecasts. So let's move to the next slide, where we have um, the Delphi method. And the Delphi method you could call an anticipation deluxe because it is very time consuming. Uh, it can be very consuming also in terms of resources, human resources and money that you have to put into. But it's very interesting. It can give you long-term uh, outlooks. Uh, in some countries, they use Delphi studies to even look into the next 30 years and try to assess what are going to be the tendencies. Uh, what you do is that you have a large number of experts and a reduced number of questions and different question rounds. And for each new question round, you provide the results of the round before. So experts reassess and reevaluate their judgment. Um, the next methodology are foresights and scenarios. And foresights are qualitative, so please don't confuse them with forecast, which is more on the quantitative side. Um, in foresight, we look at the drivers of change that I've mentioned initially, and we try to create plausible 
uh, scenarios for the future and also desirable scenarios. So good uh, and, and best cases and worst cases. And uh, you try to project that in order to reach a desired outcome or to avoid a negative development, what are the skills that you would need? The next um, methodology are the sacral focuses. And here I mentioned especially the ILO STED methodology. STED means skills for trade and economic diversification. And it is uh, a sectoral methodology. It looks at the skills that are needed to increase the competitiveness and productivity in a sector, in an industry or an economic sector. And then it looks at the capability gaps of the companies in that sector. And then through foresight uh, exercises, you identify the types of priorities in skills development and, and you basically uh, develop a sector skills strategy. If we go now to the next slide, there we have, uh, in first case, we have vacancy monitoring and labor market information. So this is the type of information that is handled usually by public employment services, where you can look at qualitative information, for instance, at the vacancies themselves and the skills composition that is wanted by employers uh, or the wages they are willing to pay. That is another indication and it's hard to fill vacancies. But you can also look at quantitative um, labor market statistics and indicators. So typically, for instance, the unemployment rate per occupation and education level. You can look at the past years and you can try to make projections on this basis for the future to come. And this is what a lot of employment services do. The next one is big data. Um, and there we talk about uh, a large amount of information mainly on vacancies and vacancy announcements and the use of artificial intelligence and digital analytics to to quantify quantify basically this qualitative information so to see what kind of uh, skills or qualifications uh, do uh, are required by a large amount of employers in their vacancy announcements and then on the basis of this, make projections or identify the skills gaps that uh, are present on the labor market. But uh, big data is still at the beginning and we have to be very careful. It has certain limitations, uh, imperfections, and it can also have biases because artificial intelligence only learns from past data. So there's an important limitation. Last but not least, we have a truly quantitative uh, methodology, uh, the forecasting, quantitative modeling. For this, you need large sets of good quality and disaggregated statistics. And on this basis, you create models for the future. And now also there are a word of caution because models are of course always a simplified reality that helps us to understand complexities, but we always need to validate this data with qualitative info because we cannot foresee changes and we cannot foresee shocks. If we now move to the next slide, we see um, a nice grid of what methods you may want to choose for what time horizon and at what level that you're working at. And you can see the different extremes, for instance, Tracer studies at the micro level, the smallest unit, for instance, a TVIT school. But that over a longer term can create very important time series and important intelligence to inform a school about where they should go with uh, uh, educational program development and skills composition. Um, you also can look at the longer end, for instance, the qualitative modeling and forecasting or the Delphi. If you look into um, a time horizon of more than uh, five or 10 years, you always want to adapt during time. You don't just do a one-time exercise. Um, if we move into the next slide, I have listed here a, a series of challenges, uh, most of which are lack, uh, linked to a lack of coordination. And um, uh, skills anticipation is inherently a multi-stakeholder and multi-level exercise. Uh, it needs shared concepts between different institutions. 
and also shared roles and procedures. Uh, institutional collaboration is important for data collection, analysis, but also for the dissemination of the data after the exercises. Uh, we had a question before this uh, webinar about what is the best state mechanism. I would say the best state mechanism for skills needs anticipation is a multi-stakeholder coordination group with an active uh, social partner participation and um, social dialogue it, it becomes very important the active participation of employers organizations and workers organizations so trade unions so employers this is pretty straightforward this is a no-brainer that we should include companies and employers but uh, please also don't forget to include workers and workers organizations because they also often know work spe specialized workers know what are the skills needed for product and process innovation um, the question whether centralized or decentralized data generation, another question that we had up front is uh, that labor markets are regional and sectoral or both. So even if you work at the national level, you should try and work also decentralized uh, and get decentralized information and, and collected and get it together. But you have to make sure that uh, you have sufficient informants that your data and your information is representative. Um, now, uh, the next slides, uh, I would just like to point out again some of the links uh, that uh, I had in the previous slide. So you see these orange guides on the left hand side. These are developed jointly between ILO, ETF and CEDEFOB on many of the methodologies that I've just mentioned. The blue guides in the middle our guides on the sectoral approaches developed by ILO, especially the STAD methodology. And then on the right hand side, you have also two courses that are being offered by the ILO Training Center if you want to learn more. Uh, I would like to, uh, oh, yeah, and you see, of course, my contacts below. So uh, if you have further questions or want to collaborate with us, I'm happy to receive uh, your mail. And um, I would say, we now open for questions and answers.